I'm so nervous and it's so good that I have this cozy chair to sit down. Um, first of all, because we are talking English today, I have to apologize to use such a dumb uh, headline for my speech because the phrase new work does only have a meaning for us in Germany, Switzerland and Austria. Uh, whenever I'm talking to people uh, in English-speaking countries uh, about my podcast, the name of the podcast and the book is On the Way to New Work, they say, ah, you're looking for a new job. No, I'm not looking for a new job. New work is the German equivalent for the future of work. Um, we came up with this title on a trip to New York, and my uh, co-host, my podcast co-host and co-author of this book, uh, Christoph, um, was on a plane filming himself on the board toilet, toilet, second time in New York in two weeks. And um, the problem is he is a YouTuber and a, a dyslexic. And it's a strange combination, especially when you put this into social media. So dyslexic in German is Ligasthenica. And he wrote a text, a copy. He wanted to say on the way to New York, but he wrote on the way to New Work. And on this trip, we came up with the idea to do a podcast in this area of New Work. And when he showed me the film and I said, well, there's a misspelling, but maybe this could be the name of our podcast. This is the story behind. So um, now the reading starts. Um, the world, and I have some pictures because otherwise I would keep the promise uh, Stefan yesterday made to bore you out of the room, so I, I thought this could be helpful. The world in which we live and work has changed significantly over the last two decades, both culturally and technology. Technology, I have to come into the language. A change that will take place at an even faster pace in the future, driven by new technologies and the major challenges we face. The coronavirus pandemic has also changed our everyday lives. At the same time, the limits of our growth to date are becoming increasingly obvious when we look at the state of our planet. None of this comes without warning. This gentleman is very important. His name is Fritjof Bergmann. He's a philosopher, and he is known as the godfather of new work. So new work was meant as an utopia and not as a bullshit bingo buzzword phrase it's used right now. And he foresaw in the early 80s uh, the four tsunamis, the ever widening gap between wealth and poverty, the waste of our natural resources, the ongoing destruction of our climate, and the destruction of our culture. Bergman saw the causes of the four tsunamis in a misguided development of our understanding of work and the economy. For many people, work had become something that made them ill and weak. He saw the new work movement as an opportunity to reverse these developments and empower people. More than ever, we need sustainable forms of growth and economic activity to overcome the challenges facing our society and turn them into opportunities for us all. What has brought us here will not get us anywhere. New work, or the future of work, will and can, if the term is defined broadly enough, be part of the solution. It is far more than a buzzword or an attempt to make work even more pleasant for a small group of already privileged people doing remote work from Thailand. New ways of working and new ways of doing business must reach everyone, from supermarket, care and factory workers up to the CEOs of stock-listed companies. There are numerous examples that show that it can be done and the realization that it is the only way that comprehensive change can work is spreading. Our podcast that just celebrated its uh, birthday number seven on May 1st, which is Labor Day, and our book are dealing with the question of how work can become something that empowers people, makes organizations more sustainable and resilient, and can contribute to solving our social challenges. It is a synopsis of more than 400 episodes of our podcast, our experience from consulting mandates, coaching, company development and leadership roles, as well as what we learned from experts all over the world. And last but not least, from our own experience, and in my case, mistakes. 
For us, the term new work describes three areas. It's about better me, so individual starting points for experiencing more meaning and fulfillment in one's own work. And I very often, uh, when I get asked, why are you starting with better me? It's the same you have in an airplane when they say to you, please, uh, in the case of the emergency, use oxygen first and then help others. I believe we have to strengthen ourselves before we can help others. It's about better we, approaches for shaping collaboration in teams and as an organization in a meaningful way. And it's about a better society. So social opportunities and challenges that we would also address in the context of work. And what I do now is not reading 420 pages of uh, boring concepts and ideas, it's stories. It's seven stories from over seven years of talking to people all over the world. And I use the, the structure in our book, uh, so the better me, better we, better society, and I start with the first story, which is in better me, in the um, uh, cap capital, capital, what is capital? Chapter, thank you so much. Self-reflection, it's the start of the book. The real talent. We usually open our podcast episodes with the same question. How did you become the person you are today? Our guests answer this question very differently, both in terms of length and in terms of what they say and how they say it. But no one takes this question lightly because it touches on our formative moments. These can be forks in the road where we took a right or wrong turn. They can be mistakes, special experiences, important encounters, or special phases of life. This question is about our journey to ourselves. We humans manage to work for a while, regardless of our own wishes, abilities, and talents. However, this often leads us into situations that do not make us happy. We often follow beliefs, inner realities, or firmly anchored opinions about ourselves and the laws of the world without questioning them. This includes, in particular, and I know what I'm talking about, the many well-intentioned ideas of parents who often pass on their own truths that have often already been passed on to them. Sooner or later, however, most of us come to the point where we ask ourselves whether we are really living the life we want or what life is all about for us. Self-reflection can be the first step in answering these questions. If we know where we're starting from, and where we want to go, we have a good chance to taking the right commuting path for us. Only if we recognize the need for change, we will find the strength to initiate it. And only if we work with ourselves and not against ourselves, can we become more self-determined, more fulfilled, healthier, and therefore happier in the long term. Our guests often describe moments of self-reflection that have led to inner growth or opened up new commuting with which always touches us and makes us think, such as the story of Christian Vorländer. In response to our opening question about how he became the person he is today, he told us the story of a boy who got the hiccups at the age of 10 during a solo in the children's core at church, and who years later, also in church, was unable to finish a piece on the piano that he actually knew by heart. It is the story of a boy who loved music so much but had to realize for himself, I don't feel so comfortable in the spotlight. I'll leave the performing to others who are better at it. This is the story of a boy who, after a few years without music, discovered his destiny through intensive work with music software. It is the boy who, after studying music in the Netherlands, went to Los Angeles, where he spent many years learning and perfecting his craft as a composer with the legendary film musician Hans Zimmer. Christian's credits include 300 and Man of Steel and large parts of Mad Max Fury Road were composed by the boy with the hiccups. Together with his partner Simon, Christian is now a successful and happy music entrepreneur with his company Zwei Musik. The second story is called The Legacy, and it's in the second chapter uh, called Finding Meaning. 
Our podcast guest, Warren, Rus Warren Rustand, was in the same room when the former U.S. President Richard Nixon uttered the momentous sentence to his Vice President, Gerald Ford. Mr. Vice President, be prepared to become president. What happened next is almost all in the history books. The interesting part for us, however, is not there. Warren took on the task of keeping the new president's cal calendar or diary as one of his personal assistants. Until then, it was common practice for appointment requests to the president of the United States to be handled according to the perceived importance of the people requesting them. Warren believed this planning principle was not appropriate to the importance of the task. First, the president should clarify what his legacy should be. What does he want to be remembered for after his term of office? Priorities would then be derived from this, which should help to use the president's time actively and as, valuable resource, as a valuable resource and not to pl plan it reactively. This method became standard for all administrations from then on and was only abolished by the 45th president of the United States of America called Donald J. Trump. We see Warren Rustin's call legacy in the same context in which we locate the search for meaning or purpose. People who have an answer to this, or at least a sense of it, find it easier to clarify, uh, to clearly formulate their priorities and thus also lay the foundations for effective, doing the right things, and efficient, doing things right, self-management. In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey asked two central questions. First, are you the person you want to be? And second, are you doing what you always wanted to do? And Covey backs up this question by using the metaphor of a ladder, which for many people is their central success benchmark. But if the ladder is against the wrong wall, it is no use having climbed to the top rung. For Covey, the principle applies that everything is created twice, first in a mental and then later in a physical creative phase. Only if we treat our lives with the same respect as, for example, building a house, where there is always a comprehensive planning phase, do we have a chance of our lives taking a good direction that we can actively support time and again. We have many more stories about learning, about freedom, about resilience in this chapter. But let's switch on to part two of the book, The Better We. Um, and story number three, the successful team. It's in the chapter of collaboration. For Amy Edmondson, it all starts with members of a team feeling psychologically safe. In her book, The Fearless Organization, she shows how psychological safety in the workplace enables more development, more learning, and more innovation. Among other things, she reports on a comprehensive study at Google that was designed to identify the success factors of teams. At first, the data from the study of 100 teams of Google seemed to make no sense. No combination of educational qualifications, personality types, and special skills could explain to the researchers why some of the teams studied performed better than others. It was only when the researchers who came from Google's renowned People Analytics team discovered the concept of psychological safety in the literature that the data began to make sense. The team was subsequently able to identify a total of five factors that explain team performance. Number first, psychological safety. Team members generally experience appreciation. Every team member is allowed to make mistakes, criticize, and point out problems. Reliable colleagues. Team members are committed to the joint task to the best of their ability. Everyone can rely on each other. Clear goals, structures, and roles. Each team member can use their strengths in a meaningful way. The goals are clearly formulated, known to everyone, and the tasks are distributed accordingly. Meaningfulness of the task. All team members are convinced that the goals and tasks serve a higher purpose, both for their own organization and ideally also for society. 
personal concern. Each team member also fulfills a personal concern by participating. There's an intrinsic motivation and an unconditional will to give their best. Psych psychological safety was by far the most important of the five key dynamics we found. It was the foundation of the other four. Summarized Julia Rosowski, who was director of people operations at Google and head of the project called Aristotle. Amy Edmondson, the researcher behind, defines psychological safety as a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, us, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. Story number four, it's in a chapter called Office Spaces, and the story is called The Magic Building. Sometimes chance has to help good things see the light of day. When the building with a number 20 was built at the renowned Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Boston during the Second World War, within a very short space of time, nobody could have guessed what it would, what it would one day become. But first things first. The building was intended to help scientists research technologies that would help to end the war. In addition to a facility in the Los Alamos desert where the atomic bomb was invented, the radiation laboratory at MIT was the second prominent location in the United States. At times, more than 20% of all physicists in the United States worked in Building 20, nine of whom were Nobel Prize winners. The three-story building was intended as a temporary solution and was to be demolished no longer than six months after the end of the war. But things turned out very differently. When the war was over and MIT was growing rapidly, the university management decided to continue, to continue using it. As a result, the building, which was clearly flawed, became a blueprint for innovative work. How was this possible? Partly because the more than 20,000 square meters of space essentially consisted of very small offices and long dark corridors, nobody, nobody wanted to work there voluntarily. So it affected almost all faculties, which had to outsource their excess capacity there. To compensate for the supposed disadvantages of the location, the users were allowed to redesign the building to suit their needs. Stuart Brand, who wrote uh, ex extensively about Building 20 in his book, How Buildings Learn, quotes the former MIT physicist Albert G. Hill as saying, if you want to drill a hole in the ground to get a little more space, you do it. You don't ask. It's the best experimental building ever. Due to the fact that all people from a variety of faculties regularly met in the corridors here, a great deal of unplanned exchange and quite astonishing ideas took place in the more than 50 years that the building remained in use. The density and range of innovations that emerge in this way are considered unsurpassed. Radar systems were perfected here, groundbreaking developments were made in the field of weather forecasting, in sea navigation, and when Gerald Zacharias developed the first atomic clock in Building 20, he was able to remove two ceilings to give it enough space. There were laboratories and rooms for nuclear science, cosmic rays, food technology, and mo modern linguistics. Companies such as Bose Corporation were founded there, and the first hackers also tried their hand there. No one has summed up the magic of this building, which many see as a precursor to co-working spaces, quite like material scientist Heather Lechtman. We feel like our space is really ours. We designed it, we run it. The building is full of little micro-environments, each one different and each one a creative space. This gives the building a great personality. It's also nice to be in a building that has so much prestige. The building was demolished in 1998, but its impact on the way we work today, and I guess in the future, remains. This is always the story, and people ask me, when, why do we need offices? We need offices because, because people have to meet, and the, the more diverse they are, and uh, <laughs> the more surprises there are in meeting each other, uh, the better innovation gets. Story number five, a new attitude to leadership. 
The most profound change is an aspect that we can least observe, review or prescribe. It's the attitude of leaders. How do I see my role as a leader? How do I see the members of my team? And what contribution do I want to and can I make to our joint success? Simon Sinek compares good managers with good parents. The basic attitude of many parents is that their children should have a better life than they had themselves. Good parents are keen to give their children access to many opportunities for their own development. They want to strengthen their children's self-confidence and teach them values and rules. They allow their children to make mistakes and they do not fire their children when they have made mistakes. Good parents therefore create a framework within which their children can develop optimally. According to Simon Sinek, good leaders should do the same for their teams. This is the real story. Peter Docker spent 24 years in the Royal Air Force as a pilot. And as a pilot, he can look back on a whole range of experiences that qualify him for his current role as a coach and consultant. One of his most formative memories, which he told us about in our podcast, was a flight captain's test that he took as an instructor. A young, talented co-pilot had to complete his last flights. Peter was one who accompanied him. He flew from London to Washington and then on to San Francisco. The co-pilot did everything right and became a pilot when he landed in San Francisco. For the return flight, Peter announced that he would complete it as an ordinary passenger and that the examinee would fly as a fully responsible pilot. Before the return flight, the young pilot asked Peter if he would take the jump seat for takeoff. The jump seat is the seat in the middle behind the pilot who always sits on the left and the co-pilot who always sits on the right. Back to the test. Shortly after takeoff, the plane encountered strong turbulence, which required the young pilot to act quickly. A single mistake could have brought the plane down. Peter interrupted his story and asked us within our podcast interview, what would you have done in my place, sitting behind this young pilot? The answer, I would have intervened, would certainly not have been unusual. His decision was different. He did nothing. He did even breathe heavily. All sorts of reactions, he explained, could have distracted the pilot. 24 hours earlier, I had confirmed to him that he had all the qualifications to fly an airplane, even in critical situations. An intervention would have ruined everything. Peter has developed his own leadership approach based on this experiences during this time. He calls it leading from the jump seat. I have a second story in this chapter. This is Insa Klasing, and she was forced to learn to let go. During her time as CEO of the German branch of an American company, 2,600 new jobs were created. Almost as many new locations were opened as in the more than 40 years before. By her own account, Insa practiced a cooperative leadership style and had built up a motivated leadership team. But then she fell off her horse and broke both her arms. At the time, she could not imagine taking a break for more than three weeks. However, her compound fractures made a six-week break necessary. During this time, she began to question her own understanding of leadership. What does it say about your own understanding of leadership if three weeks is the maximum length of an absence a manager can imagine? It was a mixture of misunderstood loyalty, the fear of disappointing the expectations of a wide range of stakeholders, the sense of duty to be there to avert potential disasters, and the self-perceived need to justify her own salary. Today, Inza calls it the irreplaceability myth. Contrary to fears, the leadership team took off in the absence of her. Unplanned and unintentionally, the members were given more autonomy. When Inza returned to the job after six weeks, this could have quickly meant a relapse into old patterns. But things turned out differently, as she was still unable to use her hands and initially only had enough strength for two hours a day. What she asked, can I do in two hours a day? Her answer was a completely new understanding of leadership. She called it the principle of autonomy and 
she wrote a book, The Two Hours Boss. The focus remained on what had already worked so well in the six weeks of her absence, the autonomy of managers and employees. Inza decided that leadership should only focus on what would further strengthen autonomy and form that from that moment on limited her activities exclusively to setting a suitable framework which she calls the what. The team members decide the how, when and where within the framework. Yeah, we have many other stories about organization, agility, communication and so on in this part of the book, but let's switch on to the last part which is called Better Society. And the first story is called The Girl Who Was Always Too Noisy. It's in the part of education. In the most watched TED Talk today, the presenter, education expert Sir Ken Robinson, who died in 2020, confronted his audience with a question that has been a topic of conversation ever since. Do schools kill creativity? In this TED Talk, he told the story of Jillian Lin, among others. It was the story of a young girl in the 1930s who was di diagnosed with a learning disability by her school. Today, the diagnosis would probably be ADHD or ADHS in German, but back then it wasn't an issue. Together with her mother, Jillian finally visited a specialized doctor. Her mother described the problems she saw in Jillian. She couldn't concentrate well and was constantly fidgeting. She was disrupting her class and was regularly late with her homework. During the conversation between the mother and the doctor, Jillian sat on her hands for 20 minutes. I know this because I did this in this age. The doctor stood up and explained to the then eight-year-old girl that she could wait a few minutes because he needed to talk to her mother alone. Wending out of the room, he turned on the radio on his desk. Outside, he asked her mother to take a look into the room. Jillian had stood up. She immediately started moving and dancing to the music. After a few moments, the doctor explained to the mother that her daughter was not ill, but a dancer. Her mother followed his suggestion to enroll her daughter in a dance school, and the rest is history. A few years later, Jillian was accepted at the Royal Ballet School, and after a very successful career as a soloist, founded the Jillian Lin Dance Company. An encounter with Andrew Lloyd Webber also led to a long-standing collaboration, and she went on to choreograph some of the most successful musicals in history, including Cats and The Phantom of the Opera. Jillian Lin died a wealthy and happy woman in 2018. If she had met another doctor as a child, he would probably have prescripted her a drug and told her to calm down. Robinson sees the causes of stories like this in our education systems. They are an invention of the industrial age and their development was primarily about meeting the needs of industry, he says. Accordingly, subjects useful for work were considered particularly important while creative subjects received little attention. In addition, Robinson believes that academic skills have dominated our understanding of intelligence since this time, that the universities, which also played a driving role in shaping education, created a system in their own image. In his TED Talk, Robinson describes the system of public education as a drawn-out process of a university entrance exam. Many people who have more creative talents are discouraged, overlooked, and filtered out as a result. Fortunately, his plea to change education systems so that they enable children and their parents to discover their talents and interests at an early age is beginning heard more and more. Indeed, there are approaches in Scandinavia or New Zealand, for example, that point in this direction. So when we talk about education in the context of new work, we are guided by holistic interpretation of the term that encompasses a lifelong development process for people in the formation and further development of their personality. It is important to note once again that at the heart of the original new work idea 
was that people should set out in search of what they really, really wanted in life. This requires an early engagement with questions such as self-reflection and finding meaning, as well as an examination of one's own strengths and weaknesses. Traditional education systems hardly give these topics any space. This is why many adults find it so difficult to deal with these questions later and why they end up in jobs that don't make them happy and no longer dare to follow their feelings. Or in his words, since of some of the most brilliant and creative people I know were not good at school, many of them only discovered what they were really capable of and who they really were when they had left school and recovered from their education. Okay, we're almost through. Story number seven. Still in part three, Better Society, in a chapter which is called Utopia. People are good. And I'm so happy and so thankful for Stefan's speech yesterday, Stefan Sargmeister, now is better, because what I'm telling you now is in the same direction. It's hard to believe right now with the catastrophes we're seeing around the globe, but I do hope that after the next couple of minutes you, you follow this thought. The opportunities we currently see are primarily based on a fundamentally positive view of humanity. The Dutch historian Rutger Breckmann, so we have Bergmann and Breckmann, offers a current and comprehensive contribution to this view. Using numerous examples and studies, he provides concrete indicators that many of our previous assumptions were wrong. Among other things, he shows that the novel Lord of the Flies, published in 1951, was probably wrongly awarded a Nobel Prize for Literature. The Swedish committee's justification for its supposedly realistic description of the state of the world at the time seems grotesque in the light of Bregman's research. Bregman describes how sad the story made him as a child. At first, he did not question the image of humanity portrayed here. But when he read the book again years later, his doubts grew and he began to look into the biography of William Golding. In short, a bad guy. He was a depressive alcoholic. This does not mean automatically he's bad, but he bet his children and his wife and had strong sympathy for national socialism. In contrast to Golding's fine fiction story about the surviving boys of a plane crash who behaved bar Barry Kelly on a desert island, and three of whom did not survive the dramatic events, Bregman researched the true story of a similar incident. In 1966, Australian Captain Peter Warner found a group of teenagers from a British boarding school from Nukualofa, the capital of Tonga, who had been shipwrecked in 1965. The six boys, aged between 13 and 16, had soft in a borrowed boat out of boredom to reach the archipelago of Fiji or even New Zealand some thousand miles away. In contrast to the story in the novel, the boys stuck together even in the most difficult situations. In order to survive on the rocky island of Atta, which was actually considered uninhabitable, they established various forms of collaboration, rituals, and the procedure for dealing with conflicts. Among other things, they built a musical instrument, a chicken coop, and a sports area. They managed to light a fire that did not go out for over a year. They weathered storms, a failed attempt to leave the island, and they stuck, took, stuck together even when one of them broke his leg. When they were rescued by Captain Warner on September 11, 1966, they were all in top physical and mental shape and Stephen's leg had healed perfectly. Rutger Bregmann sums it up for us. The real Lord of the Flies is a story about friendship and loyalty, a story that shows how much we can endure when we trust each other. Bregmann goes on to mention that a whole series of reality TV formats refer to the novel Lord of the Flies. 
However, they were unable to prove the thesis that people tend to behave badly under extreme circumstances. The TV producers almost always had to and still have to help out in order to achieve the desired effect. The candidates are lied to, made drunk, and played off against each other. The sad effect, young people take such programs as a model and believe that they can get ahead in life with the help of lies and vulgarities. Vulgarheiten, sorry. Bregman cites evidence from numerous scientific fields. For example, he reports on social psychologist Tom Postmitz from Groning University, who has been giving his students the same task over and over again for years. When an airplane makes an emergency landing and breaks into pieces, smoke quickly accumulates so that the occupants have to leave the plane as quickly as possible. Tom Postmitz describes two scenarios to his students, which he calls Planet A and Planet B. On Planet A, people ask each other if they can help and if they are okay. People in need of help are allowed to come forward and people are prepared to risk their lives for other people. Meanwhile, the people on Planet B are fighting for themselves. Total panic breaks out and some people kick and push. push. They trample over people with disabilities, the elderly and even children. When asked which planet is planet Earth, around 97% answer planet B. But in fact, according to Postmas, we live on planet A. Whether it's the fact that the overwhelming majority of soldiers who have been in a war mission never fired a weapon, or the critical examination of various psychological studies that only produced the evidence they probably wanted through considerable manipulation and the exertion of pressure on the subjects involved, Rutger Bregmann backs up his thesis with countless counterexamples. Humans are basically good. I have an epilogue. It's about the new work movement of Fridjof Bergman. I mentioned this guy in the beginning. His criticism of wage labor formed the starting point of his reflections or for his reflections. Wage labor leads to dissatisfied and unhappy people and to injustice. Such work makes people increasingly ill. If we could help people to find the kind of work they, and he always said it like this, they really, really want it at heart, we would have a chance to turn work back into something that could strengthen people instead of weakening them. Bergman, again, not Bergman anymore, now we are at Bergman, saw the key to this in the revolutionary technologically developments. According to his forecast in the 80s, people will only have to spend around a third of their time on traditional gainful employment in the future. Another third, they would be spent on producing their own things uh, and more conscious consumption. In this context, he foresaw the importance of 3D printers, which he called personal fabricators. People would then devote the remaining third of their time to topics that gave them deep fulfillment or purpose. He refers to this elsewhere as the three pillars of the new work, paid work, personal work, and vocation. In our conversation, he gave us the impression that is, this is where the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge lie. We have a great educational task ahead of us. On May 23rd, in the year 2021, Fridjof Bergman died after a long illness in the same hospital where we had recorded our episode 100 of our podcast two years earlier. His work remained unfinished, but his impulses linger on and his observations and predictions remain relevant. For him, new work was from the very beginning more than what many people subsume under this fashionable term today. Anyone who takes a closer look at his work and his work will realize, his works and his work will realize that he thought utopian. The need for an alternative to capitalism and socialism, both of which he considered to have failed, 
drove him to formulate and continuously develop his ideas. The fact that we can dare to keep asking ourselves what we really, really want remains his greatest gift to us. And so, at the end of this short reading, I only have one question left. Will you be joining us on this journey? So I would love you to buy our book, to read our book, to listen to our podcast. As I mentioned, more than 500 people we talked. And I have a new format together with my younger son. It's called Zuma meets Boomer because he's Gen Z and I'm baby boomer. And uh, one more thing before you have a break again. Thank you, Rob, for your art. Thank you, Sebastian, for the tiniest museum on the planet. Thank you, Stefan, for your positive thought on your future. Thank you, Toby, for the music. Thank you, all other great contributors to, for your speeches. I was really, really so deep into it. I really felt in love with all of you. Thank you, Mark, for this amazing thing you built up over the 14 years. And thank you so much for all of you to be so quiet so that I, I can do this reading. Thank you so much, dear Beyond Tellerrand.